to Redefine Parenting with your host, Vinu Keller. We want to welcome you to Spanglish World Network and her network on Zingo TV, channels 250 and 251. Zingo TV is a free app that can be downloaded on iOS and Android devices. While you download, make sure to rate and leave a comment. Zingo TV is also available on Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire and Fire Sticks, Roku and Roku Sticks, and all smart TVs 2016 and forward. Redefine Parenting is a revolutionary approach to nurturing our children. Vini will bring you live experts, transformative insights, and a fresh perspective, all aimed at helping families worldwide truly understand their children. Together, let's give them a childhood they won't have to heal from. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Redefine Parenting. You know, I had a lot of people talk about the episode I did with Dr. Melanie. And so I'm like, I need to bring her back because the conversation we had was amazing about emotional intelligence for your kids. If you didn't get to hear it, please go to my YouTube at Vino Inspires and check out the episode and you'll see why I and many others wanted to bring her back on my show. So today, me and Dr. Melanie are going to have an amazing conversation on what motivates your kids. Because I'm going to tell you, that is one of the biggest number one questions I get working with tweens and teens and even younger kids. How do you motivate your kids? And let's face it, I mean, as a mom, I've struggled with that myself. And so I'm bringing on one of the experts, Dr. Melanie McNally. So thank you again for being here and give us some of your words of wisdom. Um, well, thank you. It's nice to be back. I love your show and love what you do. So I'm always happy to be on here. Um, as far as, you know, with motivation, you're right. Like we all experience it. We all face it, even adults. Like we all know what it feels like to have low motivation and one of the best ways to think about it, when we think about motivation and how it applies to just humans in general, is to think about how it can be broken up into three different skill sets. So motivation encompasses our internal drive, which is our like our passions, our purpose. Um, it encompasses our grit. So our ability to stick with things, even when they get really hard and boring. And then motivation also encompasses goals. So our direction, our roadmap forward. And so it's a really helpful framework to think of motivation as holding these three things, because then we can, we can look at it and be like, okay, which area am I struggling in? Or which area is my child struggling in? Is it the drive? Do I just not have like the passion for this thing? Is it the grit? Like I just don't, I haven't built my grit muscle and I can't stick with things. Like I tend to, when things get hard, that's when I walk away. Or do I not have clear goals? Like I, I've got the passion, I wanna do this, but I just don't know what direction to go or I don't know how to like focus my efforts on a daily basis. Right, right. And I love that because I've heard of this too. And I think about them being like three pillars right? Like three pillars to get us to take action, to activate the learnings that we have in our life. And I think for adults, it's easier for us because our brain is developed to look at the long-term consequences and how to organize our life and to pinpoint where are we lacking in these different three areas that you've identified. And, but when it comes to kids, I think it's hard for them because I even look at this way. Like, let's just take goals for a moment. The third one that you mentioned, even with goals, I think there comes a sense and with adults too, but mostly with kids is, am I going to disappoint someone if I don't reach the outcome of that goal, if I don't succeed in that goal? And then if I, if I'm going to disappoint someone then I'm not going to be enough, you know, like my parents, you know, and it's so funny. And, I, and I'm curious about what you hear, too, from your families you work with. But I know a lot of the families I work with, I'm like, no, 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 no. My kids know that that they're not going to disappoint me. And then when I'm coaching the kid, it's like, what is your real fear? I'm going to disappoint my parents. <laughs> it literally does not translate the same way. 
Yes. And you know, and, and it's great when they can articulate it, but a lot of times they can't, like they don't know right. that they're, that is like a deep fear that I am going to, and you'll see this in long into young adulthood of this fear of like, I'm going to disappoint people who have loved me and supported me, or maybe they haven't, but I, I still feel like I'm going to disappoint them. And that's why it's really important to try and get get kids and teens to create goals that are aligned with their own interests, not the interests that their parents have for them, right. not, you know, according to like the, the parent agenda, because no matter how well intentioned a parent is in thinking like, I know what's best for my child, it's not usually it's not going to work out for the best of the, the child because it's not something that came from them. It's not something that really like they want to be doing. And so then they're probably going to end up going off course or they're going to, you know, the first barrier they encounter, they're going to be like, oh, it's too hard. And then the parent's like, what, what are you talking about? But it's because they're going after something that they don't really feel that excited about to begin with. Right. We want to help them figure out like the things that they're curious about, the things that they're passionate about, you know, purpose is a hard thing for a young person to have. So it doesn't even have to be like this huge purpose in life. It can just be more, more of their purpose for like the next months, you know, what's their main, you know, big driving thing that they want to strive for. And as long as it comes from them, they're going to be much more inclined to stay on course. Right. And here's the thing that I find interesting. I think that grit and goals are probably the easiest thing to for an adult to look at with their children and really give um, exercises to do, if you would, to show their brain like, hey, you could stick with this even though you don't like it and look at the outcome you get and then the reward of the goal. I think the hardest thing to do is to create that internal drive, the number one thing that you said, right? The internal drive in them. So I'm curious on some of the things that you see and what you're doing with your clients to help create that internal drive, especially, you know, you and I work with the tweens and the teens and it's a hard age because they're like really trying to figure out their identity. And if I do this, will I be fit into this group? If I do this, will I fit into that group? And is my parents going to be okay if I do it? Am I going to be okay if I do it, right? So there's a lot of that. So where do we help these kids to really go into that internal drive and start recognizing it? Yes. So first and foremost, we have to get them off their devices. 100%. <laughs> and spending less time on, you know, phones and scrolling mindlessly and, you know, doing watching videos that aren't really adding any value to their lives. Because in my experience, especially more recently, phones and like, you know, silly videos, silly TikToks are such a time sucker and such an energy drainer that the teens will tell me, I just, once I'm on my phone for a while, I just don't even feel like doing anything else because I just feel like low energy and I'm bored or whatever. So first and foremost, we want to look at like how much time they're spending on their phones and we want to monitor that and we want to deep to use. And if you're a parent out there and you're like, oh my gosh, my kid is on the phone all the time. How would I ever do that? Start with baby steps. You don't just like pull the phone out and be like, okay, you're never using your phone again. You want to just start, you know, with teeny tiny baby steps and like gradually kind of backing it down and, you know, decreasing the time and even explaining to them why you're doing that, what the purpose is. Teens, even if they don't agree, they do like to hear the rationale. They do like to know the reason why. And that can just, that's a really good starting point for getting your teens to start figuring out the passions because we want them to have time to time and space to explore things, to try things on, you know, to, to try out for different teams and see what feels like a good fit, try different clubs, see what works, what doesn't let them be bored and see what what that feels like, you know, and how they were going to manage discomfort. And so we can, we need, we can do that by giving 
um, the time and the space first and foremost. Right. I think some things that parents get stuck on, and even myself at sometimes, is explaining it to our kids, our 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds, in a sense that they're going to understand what being on their devices does versus being off their devices. Like, so what are some things that parents can explain in a in, in vocabulary that their younger teens will understand that like, look, this isn't a punishment. This is for you to explore what else life has to give you. Because let's face it, when you and I were kids, our parents were probably like, shut the door, don't come back until the street lights are on and go figure it out. Right. And it's like, what are we going to do? And we figured it out. We'd go walk in the park and figure out what we wanted to do. And we'd make up new games and we'd find other people that were bored too. And then we would all come together. You're not seeing that anymore. We're not seeing that at all because again, they're stuck on their devices. And so what I tell parents is that it takes away from their lack of communication and effective listening because they're just mindlessly, like you said, watching these videos or, you know, playing these uh, games. I mean, I think video games could be slightly different because there is dialogue and interaction depending. But again, I think everything in doses. But I really think the hard part comes when other kids have no boundaries over it. And then a mom or dad want to put boundaries over their kids. And it's their friends they were playing with or their friends. They're like, oh, yeah, I watched this video. And the kid's like, yeah, I, I didn't get that time. And they feel like an outcast. So what can parents do? How do they explain it to their kid? I think it starts with building self-awareness. And so in a very non-judgmental kind of a way, you know, pointing out gently to the the tween or the teen, you know, like I noticed that whenever you spend a lot of time, you know, on the couch just staring at your phone, I notice like you're kind of grumpy later on, or I notice that you don't really seem like you want to do anything else. And so you're making the observation, but in a way that's like non-judgmental, you're not telling them they're lazy. You're not telling them right. what's wrong with them. You're doing it in this non-judgmental, non-confrontational way and trying to get them to build that awareness themselves. And then you can ask a follow-up question, you know, like, so do you notice that about yourself too? Or what do you think you could do differently so that you don't, you know, spend an entire Saturday staring at your phone and then you're upset later on because you feel like you wasted the day? Mm -hmm. So what do you think you could do differently tomorrow? Or what do you think you could do differently for the rest of the day today? And so I you're kind of getting them to think about things and see what kind of solutions they can come up with. I really love those questions because it goes back to our conversation we had last month about the emotional intelligence and being self-aware and checking in with yourself. So even pointing out like, I noticed this, have you noticed this? So they can kind of do a check-in with themselves to, to, to compare that. And I'll say, you know, with my twins, um, we started using it as a reward because what we noticed is that the more nonchalant we got about checking in on the boundaries, staying true to the boundaries, the more that they were on their devices and the more it was harder to get them down for dinner. It was harder to get them in the shower. It was harder to get them to do life skill activities because they were in the middle of this or the middle of that or just one second. And so, and the conversations with us changed. They were very rushed. The tonality changed. Um, it was almost like we were impinging upon their free time and they didn't want to have that conversation because they wanted to get back to watching whatever shorts on YouTube or whatever. And so I just wanted to concur with that. I've literally seen what you've said. And, and so now it's like, we tell them when we notice a change in your tonality, when we notice a change in your behavior, we know that we need to do a detox of um, screen time. You know, we do let them watch TV, but they get, honestly, they get bored of that too, which is kind of great that they get bored of that. So then they go and try to find something else to do. Right. And what we noticed is the engagement they want to have with us now has increased because one of the things that I've noticed is kids get older, especially in their later teens, 16, 17, 18, it's like less time with mom and dad, more time with friends. And I think that we can change that in this going forward in the generation by taking away the opportunity for them just to be away from us and engaging with us and creating more opportunity for them to engage with us 
-hmm. So when we're taking away these screen times or not taking away, but limiting it or using it as a reward, they're starting to engage more with us. They're mm -hmm. wanting to do things with us. Yes. And that's where, you know, the opportunity for them to develop the curiosities and the passions comes in because they are wanting to do different things and wanting to, you know, maybe, you know, try something out with you because maybe you like to, you know, I don't know, garden. And so now they're wanting to do that with you and they're trying it out. They're seeing what they think of it. They're seeing if it's an interest that they want to pursue. And so it's giving them that time and space to kind of, you know, follow different pathways, see where they lead. And, but also it's not about each pathway leading to a destination, because I think that oftentimes what parents will do is when they're looking for their child to develop curiosities and passions, they want these curiosities and passions to to turn into something, you know, like, oh, you play soccer. So that's great. You're going to play soccer in high school and you can play it in college and it could be a career path for you. And that's like really overwhelming. Mm. We've got to back off and just be like, okay, this is great that you love soccer and let's keep playing for as long as you enjoy it. And maybe even talk to them about what it is they love about the sport because maybe they just love being on a team or maybe they love the running part of it. I had a teen client where we realized it wasn't soccer, but he loved how much he had to run on the field. And so track ended up actually being a better fit for him. And so it's like figuring out like the different aspects that you really enjoy and letting them kind of just explore and not assigning that now this means you have to follow this pathway a certain way. Right. So just to bring light, just so our listeners can see what Dr. McNally is saying is so true. So, you know, we're on this like detox right now. And I've been, uh, since I got home from my mom, I'm making homemade yogurt. I'm making homemade breads and everything. And my son's seeing this and I've actually had him help me out a little bit. And now, um, and we're also trying the independence, like you're going to be 12. You should be able to make a box of mac and cheese. And so like, we're making him do it. Like, oh, can you get me a pot? We're like, no, the pots are right there. Go get the pot. So now a week later, he wants to make us dinner. He's like, what do you guys want? You pick it. I want to make the dinner. And so um, how amazing, right? Because that developed. He's never asked to make dinner. He's never. But it goes back to that internal drive. He was so proud of himself that he was able to make his own mac and cheese the other day that without help, like from literally getting the pot, putting the water in to it all, timing it and whatnot, that now he has this like, I want to make dinner for the family. I don't want to just make it for me. I want to make it for everyone. And it tastes good and everything. So it creates that internal drive, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted, you know, circling back to that is what creates that internal drive. When we tell our brain that what we did was great, it feels good. We want more. You know, we want that feeling to be that addiction. Like, what else can I do that makes me feel good like that? Um, and the other thing, going back to your point about allowing them to explore what they want and where that wants to lead them versus insinuating that, well, you did soccer all these years, so you're going to do soccer and you're going to go to college, you're going to get a scholarship. My daughter has done dance since she was three. She loved cheerleading. And we were just talking to the car this morning. And I said, so you don't want to do dance next year? She goes, no, I think I'm done with that. And I'm like, okay, well, do you want to cheerlead? She goes, you know, I like it, but it's not my thing. And she's like, is that okay? And I'm like, absolutely. I said, you know what, honey, you're going to realize there's going to be things in your life that you love doing for a moment, for a season and a reason. And when that is done, it is done. You may just be the person in the bleachers, having a good time with your friends, cheering on other people. And that is okay too. It's what you want. And she says, you know, I really like to just run. Maybe I can like find a track or something like that, that I can just like practice running. And I'm like, that would be an amazing thing. So again, just going back to bring truth to what you're saying, I've actually literally experienced that as my 11 year olds are turning into 12, you know, and um, I think it also gives that conversation to engage with your kids that we're not setting an expectation for them to fail it. We are guiding them and supporting them in the choices that they're choosing along the line, whatever that may lead them. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, what I love too, in your example with your son and the cooking is that a big part of the, the drive component is autonomy. And mm -hmm. so we tend to be more driven when we have some control over the situation and kids, you know, they don't have much in their life that they have control over, you know, everything's kind of decided for them. And, and so when there are things that they do have control over where he or he gets to make the decision, you know, how he's going to cook the meal or what he's going to cook, that autonomy is going to motivate him. It's going to drive him. You know, I've seen examples with my teen clients where if it's a school assignment where Every little piece has been assigned to them. You know, every part of the project, they are like micromanaged along the way. They're like miserable and complaining about it the whole time versus an assignment where it's like a passion project and they get to explore and figure things out and they get to set the parameters and they get to be as creative as they want and they get to do all these different things with it. And so they have a lot more control. They tend to be a lot more motivated. So, and obviously, you know, it, you can't have it for every single element of their life, but when you are trying to get your child to have some motivation yeah. to just keep in mind that autonomy is a really important part. Like how, how can I give them some sense of role here? Right. How can I let them have a say in like what we're doing or the decisions that they're making so that they feel that. And I think that creates that internal drive. Like you said, like even when I do fan, when I teach my families to have family meetings and you know, we always talk about just like an office, like, you know, what's working, what's not working, what do you want to see differently? And giving that kids that open space to really communicate that also feels like they have skin in the game where they're more motivated internally to do what you've asked them to do because they've had a say in it. And going to your point where, you know, the kids feel like everything's picked out for them, they're not motivated by that. But when you just give them a little pieces and not everything, but just little things here and there, that they have a choice and they get to see it bloom. They get to see that it worked. Number one, it creates that um, independence, autonomy, but it, it really creates that internal drive, which I, you know, is like the, the basis of what is motivating our kids. So when your kid's not getting up for school, because this is like one of the biggest challenges parents have, is like they just don't want to get out of bed to go to school. It's a fight every time they're not motivated. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing this more and more with my clients that, they don't like school. They don't want to be there. So there, there's zero motivation, zero internal drive to go there. Now, my daughter likes it because all her friends are there. So she has internal drive. She's like ready to go. Mm -hmm. like, oh, you got to stay home from sick. You're sick. No, 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 I'm not. Look, I'm better. I'm better, <laughs> right? Like, I just need to get to school. There's that internal drive. So I really think that that's something that pam families need to work on. So what do you suggest to families that are having that issue trying to get their kid to school when school is just not internal drive? There's no grit in it. And there's definitely no, I mean, maybe some goals, but not really. It's not enough anyway. Yes. So one question I would have in, I would want the parent to think about is the, the there's a challenge skills balance that we want to have in place when it comes to the internal drive part of motivation. So if we are challenged so much that we're like completely overwhelmed, our motivation decreases. And then also on the flip side, if we are completely like so bored, you know, like it requires no skill whatsoever, we're also not going to have any motivation. So we really want to find that like sweet spot of challenge skills, you know, where we want to be challenged enough but then and have some skill, so some ability to do what's being asked for us. And so I would want parents to kind of look at school and say, okay, are they overwhelmed, you know, with what's going on at school, with how much work they have to do? Are they bored, you know, and to even consider like the different classes, if they're in middle school and high school, like which classes do they have that, that nice balance in, which classes is it really off balance? to look at the autonomy piece, like where do they have some control and some say in their schedule? 
And so maybe to think about ways that we can get some autonomy in, you know, maybe they, maybe they get to choose the electives because maybe all along, you know, the parents and the counselor have decided what electives they need to take, but maybe we can find some ways to get some autonomy in there. And then also to think about the, the passion part, you know, where are they lacking passion when it comes to school and school isn't going to be for everybody. Like, 100%, like it doesn't have to be, but if they aren't going to be homeschooled and they need to go, then it's like figuring out, okay, okay, how can we find some passion in there so that it's a little more interesting or they're a little more excited about it. And even if that means pairing it up with something like immediately after school. So maybe school itself is really hard or it's really long. So then when school ends, maybe they get to go do the thing that they really love doing. Maybe like the after the school day, that's when they get to go um, do, you know, they're on the soccer team or they're doing something really fun with their friends. And so they know that at the end of each day, there's some passion attached. I love it. I love it. So for my listeners, she's given like some really golden things on how to create that internal drive. And, um, you know, one of the things that I love about internal drive is that when you can support your children to discover that and to create it, it also is accompanied by their worth. Like that internal drive is building their self-worth. And I don't think that we spend enough time looking at that with our kids. I think that a lot of us, me, myself included, are so caught up in the rigmarole of every day of like, okay, we got this to do, we got this to do. And, and you know, with school and then homework and then extracurricular activities that we forget, how are we pouring into them to let them know that they're worth it? Like, where's their worth showing up? So I really like... Um, you know, the things that you said about internal drive. So the second one is grit, grit, sticking with things. So do you want to chime in and tell us some of the things that we can do to support our kids in, in grit? Yes. So yeah, grit is our ability to stick with something even when it's long or hard or boring. So being able to persevere towards uh, an important goal. And that's one of the big complaints I hear from parents is they'll tell me like my kid just has no grit. And I always kind of challenge them because I'm like, oh, I bet there's some grit in there somewhere. It just might not be where you want to see them gritty. You know, they might be able to stay on a video game all the way until they make it to the next level. Like that takes some grit, mm. but maybe then when it comes to, you know, finishing their essay or their college application, they're lacking some grit there. So looking, first of all, finding where the grit does show up, because what we want to help kids do is to show them that they have the capability and that it's transferable. If I'm gritty over here, like that means I can be gritty over here too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids don't make those connections. They don't see that, you know, the grit I'm learning um, that I'm developing on the video game, that it's going to help me with my essay. And if we help them see that, that like, hey, you know what, you, the other day, like I heard you talking about how hard it was to get to that level. Like, what did you have to do when you got to the point, like, I'm not talking about in the beginning when it was like really fun. I'm talking about later when you wanted to quit because you had been doing it for so long. It was hard. Maybe your friends had dropped off the game. How did you stick with it? What did you have to do? Mm -hmm. And have them identify like their process, what they had to do internally. And like, okay, so that might be something that you have to use when you're doing this essay over here. Mm, I love that. What a great question. And what a way to discover their, their recipe. I always call them recipes, but patterns, right? Their recipe to keep going, their recipe to grit is, you know, what did you have to do? And when you're saying this, I'm, all, I'm thinking about my son who gets so frustrated at the games. At times I'm like, okay, you're done. Like the TV can't take any more of your yelling. Like it's done. The TV is sad. You've yelled at it too much. <laughs> you're done. And, um, and there's times that he's just like, I'm done, I'm done. And he gets so upset. And then, and then two seconds later, he's back on it. So there's something in there that's, you know, and when I, when you were saying that I was thinking about myself when I was younger, when I was 13, 
and I, me and my best friend loved playing Super Mario Brothers. And our outcome was to save the princess. And I can remember getting so frustrated on certain levels and I couldn't get off of it. And when you were asking that question, immediately I went to myself, my head and I'm like, what did I used to do? What was it that kept me going for hours trying to beat that same level? And it was, I would keep changing my strategy. I would keep trying to figure out what did I do? What could I do differently to get past that? And I would section it off. And I think about it now, I'm 50 years old and I still do the same thing. When I feel like I get frustrated, as I'm sure you as well do, and you want to just be done and quit and I'm over it and, oh, I'll wake up tomorrow with a fresh brain. I don't quit. I'm like, okay, what, what is it? I will change my strategy. I will mm -hmm. figure out what little things I can tweak, change my strategy until I get it right. So how crazy that, how true that is. Like, seriously, like I can go back and think about it and I still do it. So we're forming our success formulas, you know, and success leaves clues. Mm -hmm. And I think some of our successes, as you're pointing out, Dr. Melanie, is they start off at such a young age and we don't even realize it. Yes, exactly. And by asking those kinds of questions and getting them to self-reflect, you're helping them. Um, the parent is helping them figure out what their internal process is when they're young, because then they know how they can apply it to other areas of life. But then like, you know, when, when we know that framework and that process, we can now even decide ahead of time, like, okay, I've got this big project I'm working on. I know it's going to be really hard because it's for this class. I I'm bored to tears in. So let me just, you know, I, but I know my framework. I know my process that this is what I do when things get really hard and boring. So I'm going to set myself up for success here and I'm going to approach this project with this framework in mind. So they can even be proactive in getting their process kind of like ready for them when they know that they're really going to need it. Oh, that's brilliant. Brilliant. One of the tools that I use to help my clients find their grit is helping them see what's on the other side of the frustration, mm -hmm. you know, like really visualizing. Let's just say you got past it. You're past the frustration and you finished it. What does it feel like? Tell me what you're feeling in your body. Tell me what you're thinking. You know, are you excited? Are you frustrated? Are you disappointed that you finished? Are you happy you finished? And then I say, okay, now look back to the frustration. What did you need to do? What did you need to do from being frustrated to get to this? And they're like, I just have to complete it. And I'm like, great. So what has to happen for that? And a lot of them are like, I need to stop looking at the time. Because especially when it comes to reading, they're like reading and like they're looking at the time like, oh, I've only gotten 20 pages. It's been an hour, you know, and then they get down on themselves. So I'm like, okay. So again, it's building up again what's their success formula, you know, what, what's their internal processing and how could we add to it to show them that success? Because the more kids feel the success and it feels good, the more they're going to be inclined to be pulled towards that success because mm -hmm. they want it. Kids want success. We all want success. Right. And they want that good feeling, you know, whatever that feeling is that they identified that is going to, that they're going to have on the other side of the frustration. They, it's such a, that's such a powerful exercise to get them to think about how it's going to feel and to actually even get them to like imagine the feeling in their body and to even talk about like, who are you going to share it with? You know, who's going to celebrate with you to really get them to just like embody that feeling because then that oftentimes can help to like push us through those really gritty moments. But then, you know, if there are parents out there that are like, okay, my kid won't be able to identify their process. They, they don't even have grit to stick with a video game going through a level. You know, those parents might need to go to think of like the, we're going to build grit at a basic level. And so right now it might be that your child needs to work on some stimulation withdrawal, you know, where they need to go for extended periods of time without a lot of stimulation. Mm -hmm. So without screens, without a lot of, you know, like intense um, environmental kinds of 
you know, cues or things going on in their environment. They just need to have some stimulation free time because that gives their brain a chance to develop that grit muscle. So you could start there. Another thing I like to have uh, my tween and teen clients do is to the next time they're taking a shower to turn the water as cold as they can tolerate it and count and see how long they can go and then go back up to regular temperature and then turn it back down again and see if they can go one second longer, turn it back up to regular and then go down to cold for a third time and see if they can go one second longer than the previous. Wow. And I'll tell them it's because this is helping you build grit. Even though it's physical, it is mental as well. And so that can be a, a fun way to just, you know, challenge them and have them like write down how long they can tolerate the cold. And, you know, maybe in the family, everyone's kind of doing it and you guys make it into like a fun competition um, to see who can do cold water the longest. And that's helping them build the grit muscle. I love it. I love it. So I used to work with kids birth to three that had developmental delays and one of the things that I incorporated with the families I worked with is that when we started it, we had to finish it. So we're talking about one and a half, two year olds, like even doing puzzles, right? Because kids are like, oh, I don't want to do it. I'm frustrated. I can't make the puzzle pieces fit. Um, and they want to stop and then they have a behavior and me working through that behavior with them, doing the hand over hand with them and then cheering them on that they completed the puzzle. Really, I literally in two to three weeks, I saw a huge change. There was less crying because they couldn't get away and they had to finish and more wanting to finish it. And like um, some people would say, no, 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 no. Let the child lead through their behavior because their behavior is just communicating. They're done with it. And my philosophy is kind of what you were saying. If we can build the grit now, what will it do for these kids long term? And that's exactly what I did. And the child still got to pick what activity they wanted to do. It's just whatever we started, we needed to finish. Mm -hmm. And I told the parents that. And I can't tell you how much these kids grew in the time that I got to work with them each week. Mm -hmm. And just letting go of the behavior that's uncomfortable and they got comfortable with it. So it's teaching your kids to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So the third one is goals. And um, I, I led in with that a little bit because I think there's a different, again, aspects to that, those goals too, and how we set them. And I'd like to lead it in this way is I tell parents, allow your kids to set the goals for them. And if it's not the goal you wanted for it, not to show disappointment, but to show curiosity. Because remember, our kids, especially in their tween and teens, their frontal lobe is not developed. They don't know the decisions they make today, the aspects it's going to have later on. And that's where we can allow ourselves to be their guide instead of dictator and guide them by being more curious versus critical with the choices that they're making and seeing it from their point of view, why this is a goal for them. What is it that they want to accomplish by these certain goals? Yes. And, you know, and for parents too, and when your kid has a goal that really isn't aligned with what you want for them to even think of what they're still getting other things out of their goal. And so maybe, you know, your, your teen has a goal of being a rock star and you think that's so silly and, oh my gosh, why are you wasting all this time, you know, playing the drums in the garage, but to think like, okay, okay what are, what are they learning in this process? you know, they're, they're building grit because playing drums is really hard and it's really tedious and you have to stick with something. Maybe they're building a community because they've got friends that are joining the band and they're getting in a lot of social connections and meaningful time with their friends. Maybe it's getting them outside their comfort zone because they're having to perform in front of people and you know how much they hate talking in front of the class. So there could be a lot of other aspects that they're getting out of that particular goal that are going to be really beneficial for them. And right. so if you're really having a hard time 
you know, getting behind a goal than to think of like, okay, but what are some of the other layers to it that they might not have identified, but I know it's going to help them in their future. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with all of that. Um, another uh, aspect of it I, I look at when we're goal building with kids is not waiting for the goal to be completed till we celebrate. Celebrating mm-hmm. along the way, like the little milestones in between to get to that bare goal, which I think also builds the grit because mm-hmm. you're celebrating along the way. But it's inviting our kids. And this is something that I never even knew until years ago about how important celebration is. Not just for your birthday, not just because you got the award of the month, but along the way, like find something every day to celebrate towards your goals, you mm-hmm. know? And make the goals attainable for them. Yes. You know, it's so funny. I just got this. I'm on someone's email list and I can't even remember who the person is, but she sends out these great emails. And the one today made me laugh because she was talking about if you had a boss where you showed up to work and you did a great job, but the boss never said anything, they never recognized it. Um, You met all these like milestones. The boss never acknowledged it, just kept telling, piling up on more assignments, more projects for you, you know, and like listed out all of these things. How would you feel about going to work every day? You know, what would your burnout level be? And then she was like, but that's what most people do to themselves. Yep. And it was such a great example of how, because we do, we often, you know, in teens and kids will do this too, where along the way, they're just, they, they meet the goal or they reach the milestone. And then they're just on to the next one. Okay, now I have to do this thing. And that's how we burn out. That's how we get overwhelmed. And it's great to have those celebrations. And then it's also great to stop and look at how far I've come. Yes. Because if we don't see, we often don't see the progress when we're in it. But if we stop and we look back and it's like, okay, what a year ago, you know, I said that I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to write a book and a year ago I hadn't even started. And now I have two chapters done. That's pretty amazing. And so now I get to see how that feels versus me just, oh, I finished a chapter. Now I got to go on to the next one. Right. And you hit a good point too. Like also turning their have tos to get tos, you know, like already changing their mindset about the, I have to do this versus I get to do this and looking at the rewards for it afterwards. You know, I mean, I do believe in creating big audacious goals and using your imagination to really create what you want. And, but I also realize that we also need some goals along the way. Cause again, like to your point, if we're just waiting to get to that one big goal, the grit's going to wear out <laughs> for sure. Yes. And you have to, you know, break the goals down. And I, I know it can be a really tedious task. And this is why a lot of people give up in this area and especially teens, but this is actually really, really important, but we want to have that big vision. We want to say like, okay, this is my overall vision of what I hope. And then now I can look at what would that look like, you know, five years from now, And then what would that look like a year from now? And then what would that look like a month from now? And then weekly, and then the weekly goals turn into like almost a daily to-do list. But those, when we look at that daily to-do list, we can trace it all the way back to our huge vision. And so we can see how it's connected. But what I found is so many in adults too, when it comes to this goal setting process, they don't want to do it because it is, it is really time consuming. I mean, when I set up my goal sheet, I mean, it takes a good amount of time and effort and I have to spread it out over multiple days because otherwise I get bored with it and I don't want to complete it. But it's so nice because now I have it. I've got a roadmap. I get up tomorrow and I know what to do. I don't even have to think about it because I've got my daily to-do list. I know how it's connected to my weekly goals, my monthly, you know, my quarterly, my annual, and then my huge vision that I have for myself. 
And so I don't have to, you know, sit there tomorrow and be like, okay, I've got two hours open in the morning. What am I going to do for it? Because I've already got everything laid out. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I think another aspect to all of these is finding the leverage of your kids, right? Like, so a lot of my clients, one of the things that I do with the ones that have a hard time getting up in the morning is creating a morning routine, mm -hmm. something that they would be excited to do or at least want to do versus, you know, not and feeling the tedious chore of getting up to go to school that they don't want to do. So I, I think that finding that leverage over, you know, if you do this, then you get this or you're going to miss out on this. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't get your homework done, you don't get to go to the football game tonight. Like it, it's just not possible. Or even like with schools, like if you can't manage your grade at a 2.0, you're not playing on the school team anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not to punish these kids. It's to allow them to see what is important and what are you willing to do for it? Yes, it's the idea of logical consequences, you know, that we have logical consequences. You know, if I forget to pay a bill, I lose my electricity. <laughs> you know? Or if you forget to turn in an assignment, you're not going to get a good grade. You know, that's a logical consequence. And so helping them see and what I often see parents do is they rush in to rescue and prevent those logical consequences from occurring. But we really want them to deal with the consequences, to have to learn from that because they're going to learn so much more from the logical consequence than they are from you preventing it from happening to begin with. And so, and that's how they're going to figure out even like when it comes to goals, what works for them and what doesn't work for them. They're going to have their own consequences along the way that they're, they're dealing with. And when parents can take themselves out of it. So if a you know, a consequence might be around school or around grades, let that be between them and the school. You know, the parent wants to provide the, the structure and can provide some of the support at home, but they're already getting the consequence at school of the bad grade or the, you know, the low score or whatever. It's interesting because I have so many clients that the parents are doing the homework for the kids. And I'll tell them, I'm like, what's your outcome for doing that? And it's like, well, they're just fighting me on it and they have this test tomorrow and they really need to get this in. It's gonna be part of their grade. I'm like, and what's your outcome? Do you, Are you helping them or are you hurting them? Mm -hmm. And here's what I my hallucination is, is that parents don't want to look like they didn't care about their kids to force them to do it. So they rather get it turned in, you know, or they think that they're relieving the stress of their kid, but yet the kid was playing. The kid was on their, their tablets all afternoon. There's no stress on that kid because mm -hmm. they know that you're going to rescue them. And, and I have seen it more now than I've ever seen it in the years that I've been coaching is mm -hmm. that parents rescuing their kids so they don't have the logical consequence, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's just, it's, it's interesting. It right? is, and it, it is such a disservice because, yeah. you know, you are neglecting them from the opportunity, first of all, to, to build their grit, to find their inner resource, because maybe they do have that inner drive to finish this thing or to learn, you know, because if they don't do it and then they have to go to school and they have to deal with the teacher and they have to deal with whatever consequences come from it. And then they're gonna learn from that experience. But that's, you know, when they're young, this is when you want them to experience that. You don't want them to, you know, not pay their taxes. And then they're like, wait, what's going on? You know, you always have rescued me. And now all of a sudden you're not, they're not gonna have those skills in place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're almost another one more minute and we're done today. Like this has gone so quickly. I feel like we could dive into more. So um, what would you want to leave our listeners with if, you know, they're really struggling to get their kids to get motivated, you know, besides the, the three areas, is there any last words of wisdom that you want to share? Um, well, 
I have a book coming out called Helping Your Motivated Teen that will be out September 1st. And so wherever you buy books, you can purchase that book. And it really breaks down all of the areas and it's for parents to help your teen. So if you are feeling lost or overwhelmed, you'll definitely want to grab, grab my book. Amazing, amazing. And I'm sure it's going to be on her website, destinationu.net. She has lots of free goodies there. People go check her out. She's amazing. Dr. McNally, thank you again for being here. Of course, I want to bring you back because this conversation is so great and so real with if we're going to give our kids a childhood they won't have to heal from, these are the basic things that we need to start doing with them now to ensure their adulthood. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for listening to Redefine Parenting and we'll see you next week. Thank you. For joining us on another episode of Redefine Parenting with Venu Keller. Follow her on Instagram at Venu Inspires. To learn more about Venu as well as download her free ebook now, go to www.venuinspires.com. This show can also be heard on Spanglish Radio Network. Please check out www.spanglishworld.ca for all your news and programming. Spanglish World. Watch it, hear it, read it, download it.